Hello and welcome to the Hail Mary GPP NFL podcast for week 16. I'm Big Italy 42. He's Josh Shepardson at Beachhead 50. And we're talking about a lot of your favorite plays, of course, for GPPs for this week. And only two weeks left of the regular season. Really, probably three playable weeks total left of uh, including the playoffs. I mean, the following week's going to be, you know, slim pickings. But either way, you want to get your NFL action while you can. So uh, Carson Palmer has certainly made a lot of people some money this season. Um, last week... We're looking at David Johnson kind of stealing the uh, the thunder for everyone, and Palmer didn't have a bad game, but by his standards, the one touchdown pass, all the yardage that uh, David Johnson had on the ground, kind of took a lot away from you. You see that the team scoring 40 points, you generally think Palmer, two, three, maybe even four touchdowns, 300 yards. Wasn't the case, but wasn't a necessity last week, but certainly... Uh, he's been one of, if not the most consistent quarterback, not named Tom Brady this season. So he's definitely a guy with some big upside. Yeah, and uh, the beauty of Johnson coming off of a big game and his salary still being fairly low on both sides, really, the DraftKings, um, Johnson's going to command a ton of ownership. And you don't see a lot of gamers go to the well with a quarterback and a running back from the same team. The nice thing with David Johnson is he's not your typical brown and pound running back. He's also a very good receiving back. So I actually like a Palmer-Johnson stack. We've we've seen Johnson catch a few touchdown passes this year. So I don't think that just that using Johnson precludes anybody from using Palmer. I do think that it will cause some owners not to use him. But like a few weeks ago, we saw in the, uh, the big millionaire maker and the big FanDuel Sunday Million winning roster – uh, with Big Ben and D'Angelo Williams and the receivers, you can roster multiple players from this team. It's not something I would go out of my way to do, but even this stack of a quarterback and a running back works. Uh, but thankfully, you're going to see that low ownership, I think, with Palmer because everybody's going to race to David Johnson. But uh, Palmer, as you said, he's incredibly consistent. He's passed for more than 270 yards in all but two games this year. And in those two games that he fell short of 270 yards, Eh, he only tossed uh, four touchdown passes and three touchdown passes. So I think you can live with that yardage output when you're getting seven total touchdowns in those two games. So, I mean, the guy's been a model of consistency, and he's been a model of consistency at a high level. So it's not just consistently okay. We're talking about playing consistently really well this year. And uh, with everybody on, Russell Wilson, Cam Newton, uh, the recent perfor- Big Ben playing well lately, uh, Palmer I think is going to slip through the cracks and be – owned outside, say, the top five quarterbacks this week. Yeah, you could definitely see that happening. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick next up in uh, really the game that's going to kind of decide the Jets' season. You expect they're they're chasing the Steelers and the Chiefs. Um, you kind of expect both the Steelers and Chiefs to get fairly easy victories this week. So they're going to need an upset win over the Patriots to keep their playoff hopes uh, realistically alive past this week. And, I mean, Fitzpatrick's been good enough to get it done uh, this season. He's had a couple huge big upside games as well. And uh, if there was ever a time where if the running game's not working, you just throw the ball to all your weapons, and he's got plenty of those. I mean, Bilal Powell now having some nice games out of the backfield receiving the ball. So Fitzpatrick has the weapons to put up a big game. And, I mean, this is about as must-win as it gets for a team. Yeah, and he played well the first time they met the Patriots. 295 yards passing, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. Uh, ran for 29 yards, but basically negated that rushing yardage output with a lost fumble. But uh, good showing for him. He's just a tick above uh, minimum salary for quarterbacks on DraftKings at 5200 7700 on FanDuel, so he's the most expensive quarterback there. But in a week where I expect a lot of gamers to pay up at quarterback because you've got some value running backs, you got some value receivers, uh, Fitzpatrick's a nice swerve off of that by being a cheaper quarterback that does have some upside. It uh, doesn't have the upside of a Cam or a Wilson or a Big Ben, but he doesn't need it at his, sal- at his salary. If he can come close to their scoring and give you the type of salary relief necessary to grab an Antonio Brown and an Allen Robinson or an Antonio Brown and one of his receivers, uh, more on that to come, uh, that, that's, the, that's what you're looking for from Fitzpatrick. You're not looking for him to match the scoring of the other elite quarterbacks. You're looking for him to be within shouting distance and allowing you to close the gap with the, uh, the talent that you grab elsewhere with the salary savings. And I really like Fitz in this matchup. He's tossed multiple touchdown passes in 10 of 14 games this year. And uh, keep in mind that one of those games he left early against the Raiders. So really 10 of 13 full games, you've gotten multiple touchdown passes from Fitzpatrick. And uh, even though he's not really known as a running quarterback, he can pick up some yardage on the ground, averaging, I believe, around 20 yards rushing per game this season. So going to get some cheap points as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, next up, the guy who's been on a roster, off a roster all year long, finally <laughs> had the game that we've been waiting, I don't know, it seems like 20 years by now. I mean, obviously, certainly not uh, actually that long. But Christian Michael for the Seahawks. Thomas Rawls is hurt. Marshawn Lynch, nobody really knows his status, but we do know he's not going to be back this week. Um Probably not next week either, but that doesn't matter moving forward. Um, like you mentioned, it's possible that Bryce Brown gets some touches, but this is the guy that they kind of won it all along. Now he's here, back in perfect timing. It's almost like they just knew exactly what they were doing in true Seahawks fashion and uh, just got ready just at the right time. Russell Wilson's on fire. Now you got a running game, a defense that's playing well, and they are, they're the Steelers of the NFC that no team wants to play right now. Yeah, and I mean, I try not to to take player quotes and personnel quotes too seriously. Usually take them with a grain of salt, but it makes sense when you read that he looks like a different guy, that he's taking things more seriously this time around. When you bounce around the league and you've been on practice squads this year and you couldn't overtake Darren McFadden in Dallas, I think when you get a second chance with that team that drafted you on a a winning team that's giving you an opportunity, it would make a lot of sense for a player to really step up and – kind of be more professional this go-around. It showed in his line last week. He ran hard. He picked up 84 yards on 16 carries, wasn't reliant on one big run to pick that yardage up, was really just gashing the defense for five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 yards a clip. I mean, he was ripping off big run after big run, and uh, that's what they need. It's, they need a guy that can be the sledgehammer late in the game when they have this big lead against the Rams. And you'd expect them to put a big lead up. At least odds makers do. They're 13 and a half point favorites. They're going to race out to a lead. Maybe it's all on the arm of Russell Wilson. But at some point, they're going to want to salt this lead away. Or they're going to want to salt the game away with the lead. They're not going to want to leave Russell Wilson out there to get beat up by uh, a talented front seven for the Rams. And that means running the ball and running it against a defense that was very good against the run early in the season, but is really slow up towards the year and they've ended up allowing the eighth most fantasy points on DraftKings and FanDuel per game to running back so it's a very exploitable matchup even though there's a lot of big names on that Rams defense uh they've been putting a bad spot all year by an offense that hasn't helped them out and they're looking tired they're looking like a team that you can run on and I think Christian Michael is going to do just that this week I'd expect another 15 to 20 touches and if he averages four and a half yards per carry finds Pater one time you're talking about a line of like 80 90 yards and a touchdown and that's quite good at his salary on uh, both FanDuel and DraftKings. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point there. And then um, speaking of running backs and teams that don't defend the run well, um, Spencer Ware, you mentioned here how they have multiple options, of course, and uh, ever since Jamal Charles went down, it's been kind of a mess. But Spencer Ware has been the guy that gets the goal, goal line touches here, which are the most valuable touches, of course. And the Browns, one of the worst, if not the worst, depending on what metrics you use or who you ask and what stats you use, among the worst in the league at defending the run. Spencer yep. Ware is a guy who's proven that he can get it done and, you know, get the ball in the end zone when given the ball at the goal line. And nobody's really going to be on this guy, especially after Jark Hendrick West had a good game last week, but most of it came in the first quarter. So um, the fact that there's one player on his team at the same position that people are looking at, his ownership is going to be very low this week. Yeah, West is going to be high owned uh, because this matchup is juicy, but Ware is going to be slipping through the cracks, like you said. Same position, but Ware gets those goal line touches. Chiefs have a big team total this week, one of the biggest on the week, over 27 points this week. Uh, so they're going to be in a position to score points. Uh, if those, if that position is inside the five, Spencer Ware is a pretty strong bet to reach the end zone. Uh, the Chiefs, or I'm sorry, the Browns have given up 134.9 rushing yards per game, which is the second most in the league. They've surrendered 11 rushing touchdowns, and now only seven of those have come to running backs. But given the fact that they've been just beaten by running backs all year, it seems a little fluky that, Four of those touchdown runs weren't by running backs. I think that was just a product of whatever the team wanted to do. They could have run the ball in, whether they were using their backs or their quarterback. I don't think it really mattered. So if you look at it at adding up 11 rushing touchdowns and they could have all come to running backs, all of a sudden that Browns defense that already looks super soft, looks even super softer, if that's a thing. Um, the, the, the Chiefs have been more than content to just run the ball and take the ball out of Alex Smith's hands. He's uh, thrown the ball 25 times or fewer in four of the team's last five games. And uh, Spencer Ware has only carried the ball double-digit times in a game twice this year. And all he did was total 210 yards rushing in those two co contests combined. So, I mean, he doesn't need a – he hasn't even reached 20 carries in a game. Doesn't need a ton of carries to put up a lot of uh, 
yardage, and I expect him to get the ball 10 to 15 times this week, and I'd also expect Sharkandrick West to get it 15 to 20 times. I think they can run the ball 30-plus times this week. They're big favorites, and uh, when that ends up being the case, if Ware's able to rip off four and a half yards of carry and find pay dirt, we're talking about 50, 60 yards and a touchdown, and I think that's a very realistic goal for him, but I also think the ceiling's a lot higher than that. He could score multiple touchdowns. He could rip, he, he could end up carrying the ball 15 to 20 times in flip-flopping roles with Charkandrick West. It's a very fluid backfield, I believe. And if he comes out looking better than Charkandrick West, all of a sudden you got a cheaper, lower-owned back who's already going to get the goal line touches, also now in a position where he can pick up some yardage too. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And then uh, next up, another guy in a similar situation in the sense that you're going to see a lot of Brandon Marshall against the Patriots. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned before, obviously, Bill Belichick knows what he's doing. He's going to game plan to take away the best weapon on the, the other team. And you got to imagine that Brandon Marshall is that weapon. And Eric Decker is the guy that continues to produce, but just continues to not be the guy that's targeted in GPPs. Although he's got a high floor and he does have upside because he gets red zone looks a ton. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, Decker actually outproduced Marshall the first time these two teams met. Uh, six receptions and 94 yards for Decker, uh, four for 67 for Marshall. So um, at least a repeat of last uh, game against New England, I think, is within reach for Decker. It was one of the few games he didn't score a touchdown in. Uh, he's actually caught a touchdown in 10 of 13 games this year, and uh, he's part. He's got 100-plus yard receiving game on his resume. He catches a ton of passes, uh, consistently catching five to five to eight balls a week. And uh, the thing is, is he just hasn't put it all together in one game yet, but he's shown that he can do everything. He can reach the ends, he can put up yardage, and he can pile in receptions. And uh, it's just a matter of time before he does all of those things in one game. And instead of getting a 20-point effort, you're talking about a 30-plus point effort. Uh, his salary isn't... Uh, uh, prohibitive to rostering other very good players with them, which is also really nice for GPPs. But I'm digging a Decker, Fitzsack, and then surrounding them with some uh, other studs. Again, uh, I'll go back to Antonio Brown because he is basically the stud of studs right now. But uh, getting some of these these super talented players and uh, still getting ceiling with Decker. And uh, as you noted, going to probably be lower owned than teammate Brandon Marshall. So even if you're looking at a low owned stack of Fitz and a Jets receiver, if you want to go real low owned, we're talking Jet, we're talking Fitz and Decker. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that. Uh, Jeremy Macklin next up, a guy you mentioned had high ownership last week against terrible Ravens secondary. But um, now this week he's facing another bad AFC North secondary. Um, I mean, a bad all-around defense in the Browns. And um, Chiefs' big favorites here. Obviously, they're battling for their playoff lives. They are in right now. But there's actually a scenario where not only do they win the division, but the Broncos don't even make the playoffs at all. So just imagine how good that would feel for the Chiefs, considering had they not lost that game um, against Denver on the Jamal Charles fumble on the final play, got run back for a touchdown – they could be the team that's on the driver's seat in this division, even after one of five starts. So uh, Chiefs, definitely a scary team as well. And uh, Jerry Macklin's been a big part of that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, like you said, he was a very popular play last week, 27% ownership in the Millionaire Maker. And I would say uh, with that ownership rate, people were expecting a little bit better than seven for 50 in a touchdown, which isn't a bad line. 18 fantasy points is pretty good at DraftKings, but... Uh, he wasn't netting 27% ownership for a sub-20 point game. I think you're going to see some owners that are a little gun shy to go back to him because they feel burned, which is silly. You got to have a short memory in, in daily fantasy. If you want to hold grudges, this isn't the, the game for you. Um, Macklin, as you noted, has a soft matchup with the Browns. They've given up the seventh most DraftKings and fantasy points per game to receivers. And even though I noted earlier with Spencer Ware that Alex Smith is throwing about 25 passes a game of late. Uh, 10 of them are going in at Jeremy Macklin's direction. Uh, Macklin's averaging 40% of uh, Smith's targets over the last four games, which is about 10 targets per game. So he Smith doesn't have to throw the ball much for Macklin to get plenty of targets and get plenty of production. So really like the upside for Macklin. And if by chance they do let Smith air it out just a little bit more, the ceiling's even higher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If this, yeah, like you said, if this one's close, I mean, the sky's still the limit with this guy. Um, Travis Benjamin, a guy that we mentioned in the wide receiver picks, 
Um, he's also a guy who's a deep threat. He has seen a decent amount of volume relative, especially to the the Browns offense. I mean, it's Gary Barnage and it's him. And every once in a while, it's Duke Johnson getting catches out of the backfield, especially with no Brian Hartline now. So he is the only deep threat on this team. And they're going to need to make some plays if they're going to keep this game close. Obviously, they're letting Johnny Manziel, you know, run the offense and see what they've got. So why not in this game where you got nothing to lose and the other team does, take some chances down the field with uh, with your best deep threat? Yeah, and as 12.5-point underdogs, I mean, they're probably going to end up in an early hole, which means throw, throw, and throw some more. That kind of volume for a deep threat like Benjamin is great because, as we've seen all year with, with Ted Ginn Jr. as an example, uh, you don't have to be an efficient receiver on volume. If you're a big play threat and you're getting targeted double-digit times, you really, in even half of those, all of a sudden, you're easily paying off a minimal salary, which is what Benjamin features on DraftKings and FanDuel. Does have uh, some touchdown scoring ability. He has caught, uh, I believe, three touchdown grabs from Johnny Manziel this year of his five. He also has two games where he's eclipsed 100 yards receiving with Johnny Manziel playing quarterback. So the two have played well together. And this is the kind of receiver that's going to play well with a guy like Johnny Football who can keep a play alive and make a broken play. Benjamin's a guy that's just going to keep streaking downfield and get behind the secondary. So when Johnny Football goes into one of these crowds where – uh, Tom Bahali and that, that, that defensive line are grabbing him and he squirts loose. It's going to be Travis Benjamin that's going to be streaking down the field waiting for that long, long touchdown saving play. And uh, so I like the matchup. The Chiefs have allowed uh, the fifth most DraftKings and FanDuel fantasy points to receivers as well. So as good as that defense is, they're not bulletproof. And I think Benjamin is the best piece of a game where the Browns are going to have to air it out to play catch up. And uh, Benjamin's the guy to own. Yeah, yeah, I'm certainly with you there. Um, last up, another Benjamin, but the opposite Benjamin. First name Benjamin, last name Watson. And uh, we're talking about how he's been a guy who's been seeing a ton of looks in this Drew Brees-led offense. And obviously it's still a pass-first attack. Uh, Mark Ingram randomly was hurt and was out for the season. I mean, you don't have – I mean, it's it's a pass-first and pass-second attack essentially right now. And, I mean, there's going to be a ton of volume to go around – and he's been one of the higher volume players on this entire offense. So you got to imagine that Drew Brees and the Saints are going to find a way to get the ball to their big tight ends quite a bit once again. Yeah, the last two weeks he's been targeted 23 times. So uh, a lot of targets, 40 targets in the last four. If you want to go back a little further, average of 10 targets over the last four games. Uh, in his last two games, he's caught uh, 13 passes for 119 yards and a touchdown. Uh, he's... Knocking on the door, setting career highs basically across the board. So you'd think Benjamin Watson's got a little bit of extra incentive to really play well here down the stretch, set some new career highs. And you don't usually see that from a 35-year-old tight end, but uh, he and Breeze have played really well together. We know Breeze is like to throw the ball to his tight ends in the past. Obviously, Jimmy Graham, a different animal than Watson, but they've continued to use the tight end heavily in their offense. And uh, one thing that I really like about using Watson this week is he's opposing a guy who's going to be one of the chalkier plays at the tight end position, and that's Julius Thomas. Everyone and their brother knows how bad that Saints secondary is. Everybody knows that they've given up the most fantasy points per game to tight ends. That means Julius Thomas is going to net a big ownership rate. That means Benjamin Watson is probably going to slip through the cracks on the other side of things. Other tight ends that are going to net a lot of ownership, the red hot Delaney Walker, who's been playing really well all year. Greg Olson, because he's the top target for Cam Newton in that Panthers offense. And then Gronk, because Gronk is Gronk, basically. So that leaves Benjamin Watson as a guy who's probably going to net around 10% ownership, maybe 10 to 15% ownership, maybe even under 10% ownership, but not going to be a guy that's going to gobble up a ton of ownership. And he's got a soft matchup in his own right. As bad as the Saints are, Jaguars aren't far behind them in terms of fantasy points allowed per game to tight end. So really like Watson in this one. And the fact that he is a bigger target in the red zone makes him a strong play too. The only thing that's really worth watching this week is make sure that Drew Brees is playing. Obviously, uh, we'll know more on that closer to the weekend. He's dealing with a torn plantar fascia. It doesn't look like he's going to be ruled out. There really hasn't been any talk that he would be. But with the Saints not playing for a heck of a lot uh, other than pride at this point, uh, you got to keep an eye on that, but I'm not overly concerned. Obviously, I wrote him up because the expectation is that Breeze is going to play, but if something takes a turn for the worse between now and Sunday, uh, Watson, obviously, his stock gets gets bumped down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, anybody anybody in that offense, like you said, without Drew Breeze is, uh, is a no thanks for me. But um, hopefully we helped you out here a little bit. 
That'll wrap things up for us for week 16. Find us on Twitter at DF Cafe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got lots of other great content at dailyfantasycafe.com.